good evening uh, namaskaram and uh, thank you to for inviting me onto the platform and to be able to connect with a lot of fellow educators and colleagues and uh, nice thank you thank you for a wonderful introduction although you frightened me by putting the dub of uh, expertise especially when you have to put the tag of expertise on democracy and citizenship so the two very very broad areas but uh, yes i'm very excited as an educationist and uh, i hope that i'll be able to share a few thoughts uh, and then we'll be able to open it out into a discussion in a far broader realm of uh, how how we live on this planet so uh, if i could request you to put the presentation on and i'll keep requesting you to change the slides excellent all right i'll keep nudging you how to keep you so um uh, once again a good evening to one and all and i know uh, six o'clock in the evening is not the greatest of time uh, to who uh, sort of hold the attention span and to remain focused but that's the biggest joy in education how to hold everyone's attention whether it's morning afternoon or evening whether it's a weekday or a weekend and uh, I have been doing that for a good part of 46 years and have enjoyed it thoroughly and continue to do so. And the journey started like many of you uh, connected today as a teacher and gradually I've grown into various roles and the last good 30 plus years of my life have been in leadership and in uh, heading and directing schools. Um, I, I think um, the topic itself fostering citizenship and democratic values in school education is fascinating because on one side we could take it uh, for granted and assume that that's what schools are all about on the other hand neither is citizenship very clear or the broader scope of it nor the democratic values and quite often values and processes interplay with each other they go hand in glove and it doesn't come naturally, surprisingly. It has to be protected and valued. If you look at the history of mankind, actually in most of our history, or say at least in the last two to 3,000 years, uh, democracy has always come at a premium as a citizenship. And most of the time, it has either been the leadership, which is um, the rulers, kings, queens, or autocracy, or uh, rulership, military rulership, and uh, quite often the citizens have had to change their stance or to adapt their stance and have found it difficult to be able to have a mind of their own unless they are truly in a democratic setup. But here we are in 2024 and lots of exciting changes in India. It suddenly leapfrogged into one of the top nations in the world where there's economically or on various other fronts, even on the side of development, which even 20 years ago, we would have wonder, wondered if it would ever happen in India. And here we are, you know, we've seen. And in the last four years after the pandemic, or three years after the pandemic, what a leapfrog this nation has made. We, we tend to be cynical, we tend to be critical, which is not a bad thing in life, but we should also learn to be appreciative because a lot has happened. And of course, a lot of things have to be done. Let's go straight into school education and see what we have to say there. Next slide, please. On. You know, uh, I always like to throw this question, which is a little philosophical and it comes to us from any angle possible. And the question is, who am I? And that is our starting point for today's discussion. Because in every school, I think that question should come, starting with us, the leadership, or the teachers or the people guiding the students and then most importantly we move on to trying to answer who am i if you're familiar with shakespeare you know shakespeare in one of his play has said that to thine oneself be true and i think this is such a lovely statement to be true to be deep down inside who you really are and take away layers and layers and layers of pressures, whether pretenses or ego or knowledge or even what we think is wisdom, 
and to really try and understand who we really are. Because once we understand, then we'll start doing the same with our learners, the students, and with our staff, the people who are really delivering the program. So next slide, please. Let me start with a little uh, story since we were talking about democracy. When I was teaching in Canada in an international school in 1983, uh, a very interesting incident happened. I was a teacher and they used to have a lot of fire drills because the campus was all the houses were built out of uh, wood and so they could catch fire very easily. So they used to have very regular fire drills. And once at four o'clock in the morning, they had a fire drill cold November and houses were always unlocked. The, the doors were shut, but they were never locked. And so four students came into my house uh, and I was fast asleep and the fire alarm had gone off. The fire drill had started and I hadn't emerged. And they came in and she woke me up and said, you, you're missing from the attendance of the fire drill. I said, oh, so sorry, whatever. OK, I, here I am. You know that I'm alive and fine. So thank you. Tick mark my thing and let me go back to sleep. And they said, no, no, that's not how it works. You have to come outside and being a teacher. I thought, oh, I'm a teacher. And so th these concessions allowed. And I said, it's OK, OK, come on, let's move on and think of that. Before I realized the four of them picked me up, two arms, two legs, just picked me up like a human body and dragged me out of my house. And the assembly point was about 20 meters out of my house. And they, they just did a one and a two and a three and they swung me and threw me into the grass. <laughs> and I got such a jolt as a teacher. And I thought, how can you treat me like that was my first reaction. And within five seconds, I understood what responsibility, citizenship, and democracy is all about. It is about complying and following from within, not from outside. If I'd followed the rules, they wouldn't have done that to me. And they were carrying out their responsibility. It was a wonderful learning experience for me and has always stayed in my mind. All right. So the three power habits, if you want to elevate one ourselves in life, you know, always be positive, encourage encourage and always try and understand the situation rather than judging it very quickly and initiate a process rather than waiting for someone else to start you know there's a big difference in point number two between having an opinion and being opinionated we all must have opinions all must have but we should get opinionated too quickly we very quickly start judging and that's when we kill the democracy process. Next slide, please. So, you know, one of the things which leads to success is interestingly not getting over passionate and over involved, definitely involved and definitely passionate, but not over. On the other side, many of us culturally, socially, on the religious aspects are taught to have a certain detachment. But detachment does not mean that you should own nothing. It means that nothing should own you, which means you must be a master of your own self. And that is the principle on which we should function in every school. We should do it ourselves and we should do it with all the stakeholders, all the members of the community. Next slide, please. So citizenship. Quite often, you know, we get confused between citizenship and nationality. In one word, citizenship is a bond. You know, it's really a bond with yourself, with the, your family, with your school, your workplace, your nation, and even globally. You must fit into the circumstances rather than expecting the circumstances to fit around you. And we have to teach our students that. We have to teach our students that. We have to help them to grow into that. Otherwise, too often it is someone else's problem. It is someone else's baby. No, it is ours. We are all citizens of wherever we live, however small or large that space is. Next slide, please. You know, uh, in citizenship, before we move to democracy, Julius Caesar, had once after a very long set of battles seen a very tired army in uh, in the Roman Empire. And he was quite worried that they were switching off and they were not ready to fight anymore. And he thought if he keeps addressing them as soldiers, 
they might immediately think of their families, homesickness, tiredness, injuries, all kinds of things. They lost friends and all kinds of things in battle. So what he did was he addressed soldiers as citizens. He made them suddenly think far bigger than being a part of the army and then being a part of an empire. And that without them, the empire wouldn't thrive. It just transformed them and the bent backs, the people who were getting disillusioned, all suddenly got very charged up and he had another army all charged up, ready to fight for the battles and back him totally into the next move and thing. So citizenship and believing in it is huge. There are lots of aspects about democracy, you know, but I, I, you can search it. I'm not going to go and define democracy, but we all know that it is one of the most valued things in India. And all of us in India are very proud of it. We call ourselves the largest democracy in the world. And every school should be like that. It is the most democratic process. But it is tougher to promote and sustain democracy. It's easier to make it into a one-way flow. And these are the seven words uh, that you can read. And you can decide whether all seven are relevant, which one is the most relevant. And for me, mutual respect and a balanced perspective in democracy really are two of the strongest of the seven pillars because with that, all the other five come into play, whether it's freedom, equality, fair play, justice, or collaboration. Mutual respect, which means no child is too young and no teacher is too old. No employee is irrelevant and no employee is over-relevant. We must learn to balance it out and get everyone to become a part of the process called democracy and our organization. Next slide, please. Quite often, we think in democracy, it is the right to talk, freedom to talk, freedom of expression, and everything. Yes, it's very true. The day the freedom of expression goes, our very persona goes. You know, because the democracy is self it is self governance it is swaraj you no know? and feeling that we did it not that someone else did it or i did it it's a collective responsibility but quite often we think it's expression the right to talk for me there's a bigger angle to democracy and that's the art of listening to those who are talking just think about it for a moment and suddenly your classrooms your meetings, your style of functioning will take a new dimension because very quickly you'll realize that however young or inexperienced that mind is, once it's talking, it needs an audience. It needs someone to listen and hear. And, but more than hear, it needs to listen, process in the mind, think about it, reflect on it, and then have a right to talk yourself. But quite often, we cut that off saying you don't know, you're too young, you don't know this. Process this in your mind and especially in the classrooms. That is why you'll find now that if you look at the process of how classrooms are set up in the more modern context, they're normally set up in squares or rectangles or furniture so that students can talk to each other a lot more. Group work, pair work, even the new NEP is encouraging you to do that. Pair work, group work, projects and sharing and things like that. And the teacher becomes more and more of a facilitator rather than the source of it. OK, so please keep this in mind. The very important aspect, especially in school life, because those are some very formative years and never underestimate the children, even if they're three year old. Uh, they have a mind of their own and we all know it. If you have children, you know what a mind they have. And sometimes they can be very stubborn. Stubbornness is not necessarily being stubborn, but sometimes trying to express themselves that no one else is hearing them out. So be very clear about that aspect and develop that. Next slide, please. So here's a person who has his own mind. Look at the spelling of sandwich. Now, the spelling is wrong, and I'm sure none of you want to eat a thing which is made out of witches and things like that, or made out of sand. <laughs> but to the person selling it, it really doesn't matter. He's in self-rule and he's governing and he's selling at a very affordable price of 10 rupees. 
and he's getting on with it and he's making money. So in our mind, we could say, what nonsense is this and the incorrectness of it and all. But we must also see as to how people come into their own world, they create their own Swaraj and they thrive and work on it. Yes, it would be nice to point out to him as I did once. And I said, actually, the correct spelling is this. And he turned on and told me, how does it matter? My business is still thriving, whichever way I put it. Maybe because I made a mistake with the spelling, they come more uh, curious about it and things like that. So he had his own view and his own way of working on it. And he was thriving about it. So there is a correctness and there's an opportunity where you correct or you let it go through. All right, next slide, please. So three leadership traps we should avoid uh, to sustain the democratic process. We often feel that we have a transformational vision and now I am, I, 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 the ego comes in front. I'm going to sell it to you, to the rest of the people. And once I do that, you must buy into it. Not really true. Quite often, best practices with very little knowledge of the soil in which it must take root is the cause of the problem. The idea may be good, but the setting, the timing, the purpose, where is relevant, it may not be true. Even in one state, there's so many diversities. In one city, no two schools are alike. And so we must look at the situation and put in the practices according to that, rather than just bring something and clone it because working elsewhere. And the third is emphasizing transformational change in itself without blending it into the day-to-day -day functioning. Just bring in, bring in a change. We assume that the only thing constant in life is change, bring it about and it will happen. But no, it must be relevant and the blend into the functioning of the situation. This is whether it's a lesson, whether it's the classroom, whether it's an activity, whether it's a staff meeting, whether it's interacting with the management, whether it's what, after all, what is the purpose of education? Knowledge is sitting in your laptops and sitting in your mobile phones, easy to access these days. The challenge is more and more about interpretation. And you know what I mean, even interpreting democracy in today's times is a huge challenge and sustaining it at very high levels is in itself a challenge. It doesn't happen automatically. Next slide, please. Uh, one uh, example of successful adapted democratic leadership. I have known a head of a school and uh, he was a very strict disciplinarian, but he also had a sense of fair play. He also sent a sense of balance, as I told you in my three, seven pillars of democracy. And once, there were two students with the same name and he went and punished the wrong student very severely. And the student kept quiet. He tried to protest, no one listened, and so he accepted that. A couple of days later, the principal realized he has punished the wrong student with the same name. And he was very embarrassed. And he asked the student, why didn't you raise your voice? He said, I did, but no one's ready to listen to me. There you go with one of the previous slides, listening. And he said, what do you mean? He said, I even tried to tell you. But you thought I was just protesting and trying to cover up and you didn't listen. The principal was very embarrassed and he said, OK, I've got to rectify it. And now you have to punish me. And the student was embarrassed. He said, How can I punish you? You're the principal. He, needs, he says, no, I insist. You find a sort of punishment which you think is equal to that. So the student plucked enough courage and he actually punished the principal, gave a punishment which was pretty severe. <laughs> but the principal, being very democratic, accepted it and got his own punishment and apologized. And then he apologized, brought the student on the stage and apologized in front of the school, saying, I made a mistake and I retract my punishment. You know, that is the spirit of democracy, which really makes people great. So for successful adapted democratic leadership, the mantra is always giving space to the individual, but make sure that each one is a team player. You cannot have islands. You cannot have just isolated people, but you cannot wipe out individuality either. Change is inevitable, as I told you, and it's constant, but it must be adaptive and sustainable, as I told you earlier. And the system is best when the ownership comes from within each stakeholder. The hallmark of good citizenship is the bond and the ownership. It is yours. Everything is yours. Take ownership of it like there is no tomorrow and there is no second opportunity. And if all the students are made to do that, 
that is vital. Let's see, if you look around you, that's one of the problems. We never emphasize enough on the garbage and the pollution, never in this country. And we just throw it. We keep our houses clean, but we throw everything out of the window and everything on the roadside and expect someone else to pick it up. You know? But there are lots of other countries which generate more garbage, but you won't see it lying anywhere. That's because inculcated as part of the education. But we think it's not part of the education. It's not part of the curriculum and the syllabus. Bring such examples, hundreds of them, into the lifestyle so that the curriculum gets expanded. Not everything can be there in the textbook, but a lot of it can come into a day-to-day -day teaching. It doesn't take more than 30 seconds or a minute to bring that in. The one more thing that happens, and that is called essential agreements. I've always encouraged teachers, have an essential agreement with your students. It's from basic things, is, I will raise my hand before I speak. No, I will not interrupt someone. I will not throw garbage on the floor. I will not do this. I will not. You have certain, and also essential agreements are, I will do this. I will do that. It's not all about negativity. It's also about positive reinforcement. Same thing happens in meetings. You know, Then people don't cut into each other. They start listening. They don't start talking all at the same time and so on. So think about this essential agreements. It will be very successful for you. Next slide, please. Leadership is actually an improvisation. Everything of yours may be wonderful, delightful, top of the range. But what you do from moment to moment cannot always be scripted. It can't be laid down like a policy, rule book, process. What happened last year may not be relevant this year. What happened yesterday may not be relevant today. What happens to one group of people may not be relevant to another. What is relevant in the primary school may not work in the middle school and certainly won't work in the senior school. So we must also learn to recognize transformation and we must always keep improvising, even though we must have a game plan. We must have tactics and strategies, but we must be adaptive to that in the classroom, in our lesson plans, in our style of working. Next slide, please. You know, there are three concepts which we use. We still talk a lot about pedagogy and pedagogy comes from the word better is a child and that emphasizes more on teaching children uh, and uh, children centers and it centers the learning on the essential stages that a child must accomplish before being able to move on to the next stage which means it is prescriptive it is pre-decided and we assume that that is the essential and the relevant aspect of it and that is why we treat the learners like children how often do we tell an 18 year old you know, and treat them like a child rather than teach them like young adults. You know, so it's very important to understand pedagogy is slowly getting phased out because the information is so readily available. Children will learn with or without you. Next slide, please. As you move on from school to college, you move more into andragogy and andra is man. And so you treat them more as adults and centers learning on the necessary skills and knowledge to further, which means to increase, to develop personal and professional development. There is more self-learning and exploration. This leans a little more towards the development of the self I started with, who am I? Actually, when you think of it, all religions do that. All religions do that. They help you to reflect more and more and take you on to yourself. You know, that is when the free will comes in. Every religion encourages you with free will. That God will and that's free will. And it does not say you can do this, you cannot do that. It lays out the options and you are developing yourself. That's pretty much like andragogy, what happens in universities or should happen in universities. The third bitch, which has become very 11, next slide please, is hutagogy. OK, and that is the management of self managed learners. It's self determined learning and is a student centered instructional strategy. You shift from teaching to learning. You make them good learners rather than teach them. And it emphasizes the development of autonomy, capacity and capability, helping the learners to learn how to learn. It sounds like a tongue twister. But it's not. 
treat everyone as a learner and help them to learn how to learn. Because if they can learn by themselves, learning happens right through our lives. All of us are still learning irrespective of our ages. And so if we are adaptive to learning how to learn, we will continue to adapt. We will continue to grow. So remember, the shift in education is from teaching to learning, to heutagogy, from pedagogy. Next slide, please. Just look at various aspects, heutagogy and uh, in, uh, advantages. If you look at the bottom, and if you're, we are assuming this was the clock, if you look now at seven o'clock, which means bottom left, teachers have to think about the process rather than the content, which is what NEPs also encourage. And you move into the world of the learner. What are the learning outcomes? We're talking about it more and more, and not just teaching it because it's there, but the relevance of it. All children will ask, you know, why? Why should I learn that? Even at home, they're, why should I eat this? Why should I do that? Why can't I do this? They're constantly questioning you. It's not because they're arrogant or they're rude. It is because they're practicing heutagogy and they are exploring. They're trying to learn. Keep this slide in mind. I hope that uh, nicely this is going to be shared with all the participants, this presentation. Yes, yes, so we, we can so, share it. Yes, yeah, so they'll have access to all this. So we don't have to get people to write notes and take too much of time analyzing it. It's a very in, in, important concept. It's come into education very rapidly. And I'm sure most of you wish more and more of that was in schools when we were studying in schools. You know, the options, the style, you know, uh, and the diversity of learning rather than everyone learning the same. Because they are different learning styles. Not all of us learn the same way. Let's see the next slide and see what I'm talking about. So here's another signboard. I saw it on the highway somewhere. Uh, and it was in a Hindi speaking area. And this sign, believe me, is about 20 feet by about uh, 10 feet or 20 feet by 8 feet. It's huge. It's huge. And two of the three words have been misspelled. You know, something which should come very naturally through the autocorrect and the computer should show it. It's just amazing in today's time and place. This is about a year old. And it's amazing how. We continue to make mistakes despite so much of technology aiding us. So I could help by getting my taxi to stop. And I went to this guy and I said, I wanted to point out to you the spelling of breakfast and dinner is all wrong. And has anyone pointed out to you? He said, many people have pointed out. I said, so why haven't you corrected? He gave me such a simple answer. It made me laugh and made me even admire. He said, you know, actually, because of the misspelling, more people come to my daba because they half of them come to point out that the spelling is wrong. And the sign is huge and attractive. So they land up at my place and I've got a lot of parking space in one for my place. So honestly, misspelling or not, my business is doing well. And so I thought, why do I correct it when it's working well for me? <laughs> so, you know, that's a self-made man, does a self-made thinking. And he's getting on with his own mind. And me as a teacher, as a head of a school, as a principal, is trying to get him to correct it all as to what is politically correct and what is grammatically correct. And he's not concerned because that's not his prime concern right now. That's a good example of how the human mind works. Next slide, please. So discipline, we often think a set of rules, imposition, and you lay it down and everyone must follow it. It's really discipline is a self-development culture of responsibility and ownership. And quite often, people resist because they are being told. Very rarely do we inculcate self-discipline because we feel that is correct. But when you think of it, your conscience, your values, your principles, you know, the topic also is encouraging what values of democracy. And so when we talk about values and people start respecting it, automatically a culture becomes much greater and more valuable and we all become more valuable citizens of that organization. So remember, discipline, the more it comes naturally and from within, the more successful it is. Encourage that, inculcate that as a value in everyone in the school. Next slide, please. So I hope, and I'm sure you've heard of Howard Gardner in the 1990s, he had come up with this concept. He was actually working at uh, Harvard University and 
a great uh, philosopher and a teacher and things like that. And he mapped out the different talents that human beings have, you know, and, you know, from being a naturalist, loving the outdoors, to being musically inclined, to being logical, mathematical, existential, who am I, what am I, why am I on this planet, what am I doing here kind of thing, to interpersonal, very good at interacting with each other, to bodily kinesthetic, loves to show with the bodily touch, feel, express themselves through the body rather than words, to being linguistic, using words rather than the body, to being intrapersonal, reflective, within, introverts, and so on, to be very spatial, you know, uh, they, they're able to see the world, you know, most of the architects and art artists are very spatial. They can imagine and see things which we don't know. You know, like one sculptor said, this is a piece of stone, or this was a piece of stone waiting to be given a shape. And so his sculpture took shape according to what he saw, right or wrong, correct or not. That's how he sees it, and that's how he does it. Same thing with literature. We often debate, should we be interpreting literature the way the author wants it, or the way we see it? And if in a class of 30 or 35, there are 30 different interpretations to a poem, is that wrong, or is that correct? These are debates which have no fixed answer, but we are wired differently. And Howard Gardner said, one size fits all is a wrong approach. We must respect students in that. For the same reason, just think of it. Most of the time, our assessment is in reading and writing. We read the question paper and we write answers. Well, most of our working life is about listening and speaking. And those skills are not emphasized on enough. And yet we think a student is successful getting 99% and 100% and 98%. And then quite often they are unable to con communicate in the living world the way they expect it to. So our intelligence is very, you know, and the way we communicate, the way we work on is different. Our styles of learning is different. And so Howard Gardner encouraged that schools must cater for all these aspects it's not that you're one or the other. I'm sure many of you from the 100 plus attendees today, many of you have more than one intelligence. You could be very good in mathematics and yet you could be very musically inclined. You could be a naturalist and yet you could be bodily kinesthetic, which means you could also be dance oriented or just expressing yourself, the hand movement all over the place and things like that. Your face lights up when you're expressing something or the other. So. Do we have enough scope for judging and assessing people like that? Next slide, please. Then there was Daniel Goldman, who spoke about inter emotional intelligence. And we are seeing it more and more around us, especially after the pandemic. And all of you would have gone through some kind of an emotional crisis during the pandemic, especially people who felt so isolated and locked up and were unable to really come to terms with what was happening in their lives. It is the ability to understand and analyze someone else's emotions. And we can express emotions, but it's tough to read and analyze emotions. And they're saying that now the biggest danger that's coming in all of us is that we are so absorbed in our gadgets. Even when we're waiting at the airport, we keep looking at our mobile phones, our focuses just on ourselves and on the gadget in front of us. Human observation, Observing body languages is an art which is dying out. And so even as teachers, we are unable to see through the body language and the emotions of our student what is going through in the mind. We are unable to see anymore down the corridor, on the field, that something is not quite right, purely because the body language talks, not the other language and the thing. And emotional intelligence is a great way to analyze someone's attitude and intelligence. And it is far better than what used to be valued earlier, which was the IQ, the intelligence quotient. You can have someone with very high EQ and very low EQ, the emotional quotient. At the end of the day, most of the success in life lies in how strong you are emotionally. As one of the authors had once said, the world breaks everyone, and then some are strong at the broken places. And it's so true. Some way or the other things come and affect us and hit us hard when we are least prepared for it. What really happens is how we pull ourselves out and are able to bounce back into a level of equilibrium and so on. And so it's very important for you to be able to keep these skills alive 
in your working life. Next slide, please. <laughs> I read this and I found this very, very relevant. Our own, only our pillow knows the amount of emotions we hide from the world. Uh, it's so true. You know, it's so true. It's only when we are by ourselves, ready to fall asleep, or just when we wake up, that we know what our emotions are going through. But very rarely are we able to show it to the others. Next slide. They say that by 2030, 75% of the jobs that exist today will either have gone redundant or got modified so much that teaching learners to learn how to learn, to adapt, to change, to constantly explore new avenues, to unlearn and relearn should be the new mantra now itself. We're already getting too late for future readiness. It's here to guard you, know, the management of self-managed learners. Because what are we preparing them for? If a grade six student today by 2030 is graduating and getting out of school, but 75% of the jobs we assume are going to be there are already redundant. What are we preparing them for? What are they getting ready for? You already see that with happening for admission to universities. You do school exams, you break your heart and your mind and your body and your soul trying to get marks for that. And then you have to sit for competitive exams, you have to compete. Most people face rejection, 2% get selected, 98% are rejected. And there's no feeling that you're wanted on this world. That is the plight of the students these days. So they start asking, what am I going through all this for? So if we can prepare them for this slide, I think the schools will have done very well. All right. Think about it. And I think you'll find it very relevant. Next slide, please. Sometimes we talk about gifted students and sometimes we talk about slow learners. Are they really such categories? Let's relook at Howard Gardner's slide once more. Is that a contradiction? Gifted students, slow learners. Next slide, please. Who's gifted? Who's slow? As I told you earlier, someone may not be good at one aspect, maybe be very good at something else out here. You know? And so how do we really make up a mind who's gifted and who's slow? Purely by exams and marks, by the content rather than the process, by the fixed knowledge rather than the expansive interpretations. Next slide, please. Now, here's a question to all of you to think about. If I'm weaker on the academic side, but very strong in other skills, like Howard Gardner's pointed out, and even stronger emotionally as Daniel Goldman has pointed out, and very strong on the happiness quotient front, do I get ranked judge appropriately in the school report card system? Or it doesn't matter. What really matters at the end it is the subject areas, the marks and the exams and the assessment. How strong is the other thing? You know, there's IQ, there's EQ, there's well-being quotient, WQ, and then there is happiness quotient and many other quotients. There's the passion quotient. How passionate are you about it? It was Einstein who said, you know, and I, I'll uh, read that for you. I have no real talents, he said. I'm only passionately curious. That's Einstein saying, though, passionately curious. And that is what led him to be what he did. And we all know that Einstein did go through, he didn't pass through school. He had to leave school before he graduated and things like that. So quite often, what is right, what is wrong, is so difficult to assess. Does a report card really give a 360 degree angle to it? Next slide, please. You can see how emotional intelligence is so beneficial. The slide we will be with you so you can analyze, uh, analyze it further. Next slide, please. So here's a dustbin. The sign says, keep in. And I'm asking everyone, the person who put the sign has made this dustbin into an animated object, which means it has a brain and a mind of its. So it can keep the garbage inside. No one really thinks about it. And we still throw garbage into it. But it say, keep the garbage in. 
not put the garbage in <laughs> or throw the garbage in or don't litter or anything like that. You see, subtle, very subtle. And so sometimes subtle meanings make a huge difference. And we must constantly keep exploring and questioning ourselves what is right and what is wrong. I found this very amusing somewhere. Next slide, please. Here's another one. And I'm asking you whether you're ladies or you're gents, would you go to a beauty parlor like that saying, good luck? Yeah. Does it attract you that it's a good luck parlor, which means take your chance, go in. I don't know what kind of haircut I'll give you, but if you really want to come in, come in and take your chances and your risk and whatever. But the owner didn't think so about it. You know, he just put a name which probably didn't exist in the neighborhood and put it and things like that. So see how the person things and how you interpret can be two very different things. Next slide, please. So to conclude, the logic of life. When you're in the light, even your shadow is with you. But when you're in the dark, even your shadow vanishes. Just think about it. Just think about it. You know how important it is to be in the light all the time. I'm not saying in the limelight. I'm just saying in the light, all right? The sun, when it shines on you, is great, but you'll get a lot of vitamin D, which many of us are falling short of. So it's good to be in the sun. But when the sh sun shines inside you, it shines within you, that is the sign of someone doing a good job. And all schools need to make the sun shine in the child, not from just the knowledge and the light of knowledge. The last slide, please. Something that I've made my mantra a very long time ago. I came across this when I was studying literature in school or college. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. By Dylan Thomas, a famous poet. And it's so important. The moment we turn complacent, the moment we think that's over, there's run out of time, there's no hope, there's no scope, whether with the child, whether with the student, whether with the policy, whether with the system, whether with a colleague, moment we think that, you know, rage is not about arguments and fighting or whatever. It is about the spark. It is about the energy. Don't let the spark in you die out. After 46 years in education, I still get excited waking up in the morning and I still look forward to visiting schools and I get very excited getting into the classroom. I get very excited about connecting with students and walking around and connecting with schools. It's my energy has been my life and I hope it continues to remain in me at least till I've done 50 years of school education. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope it's made some sense in a very broad sense. I suppose. So we have a first question here. A survey has shown that youth in India have lost faith in democracy, 85%. Are we not balancing the seven pillars? Do you feel one of the participants should answer that? Just to open it out into broader participation. Yeah, if anybody would like to answer, please raise your hands. Or you can uh, post in the chat box also. No, well, well, okay, let me respond to that. I actually think that in the evolution of the individual and the child, Actually, the children look into democracy a lot more than we realize. You know, I think in many ways, the world around us was more democratic when we were growing up, but I'm not too sure if the schools were. The schools were much tighter in a frame and things like that. Whereas today, even if the schools continue to remain in a tight frame, I don't think they are. They're opening out quite rapidly. I think the access to information the access to variety and the access to self-learning is already keeping the democratic process 
open. And the digital platform is one of those and things. So I think um, I'm not too convinced that the youth feel the democratic process is dying. I am not going away from the schools here. I don't want to look at a bigger platform. I don't want to look at nations or political systems or anything like that, because I think our focus should remain on the values in the school process. So I, I'm pretty positive and hopeful of these aspects. Thank you, sir, for that. We have another question here. Uh, so you have experience in Canada. Was freedom given to design learning experiences as per your choice? Uh, so if so, at what levels? Yes, uh, let me give you a couple of quick stories uh, regarding that. You know, um, it's interesting. I used to love taking people uh, away out of the classroom and a lot of activities and things like that. You know, you mentioned Dune School, that was one of them everywhere, whether it was Canada, Italy, India, wherever, even in my last assignment at Pathways. I used to love encouraging people to go out and do the things. Interestingly, when I met some of my students who met me after 30, 40 years. They still remembered all those activities I did with hiking, cycling, moving, this, that, adventure, all kinds of things, even putting up plays and things like that. They remembered all that. But some of them had the courage to ask me, excuse me, sir, we can't remember what subject you taught us. <laughs> so you see, uh, I think sometimes the experience is very far reaching, but how it gets into the mind of the children, we don't know. You were talking about inculcating in my Canada, since that's a question. Yes, for example, I was a part of a search and rescue operation uh, group. It's comprised of teachers and students. We were attached to the Canadian uh, Royal Canadian Mounted Police, which was the, the police system. And we were trained in four areas. Each one of us specialized in something, whether it was geographical, geographical mapping, uh, rock climbing and mountain climbing, first aid, or just being stretcher bearers you know, being able to carry people from an injured point. And I was personally in one year involved along with the students and some teachers of two or three rescue people, you know, rescuing two or three people, including one woodcutter. I mean, I know a lot of woodcutting and logging in Canada and, and he had disappeared. No one could find him for 24 hours or 36 hours. Eventually he had died. He had fallen off the cliff and got jammed between rocks. And it was a search and rescue operation from the school, but actually held the police to locate the person and then we saw the feet sticking out from the rocks in the river and thing like then the police took over but they didn't have the personnel and the training to be able to do that and then uh stretcher bearers and all went down and the police rescued them but they had to be brought up from the cliff we helped in all those things and we did uh, quite a lot of search and rescue including a scout camp when the kid had disappeared he'd fallen into a ditch and got injured and we found the kid and we rescued the kid now so see i mean these are the life skills. This is what helped. Now, what happens in India is we, we see something, we see a mishap, and everyone's busy making a video of it. But no one is out there to help it out. And partly it's because no one knows the law. No one knows whether it's right or wrong. So I think I find there were a lot of choices. There were a lot of variety. One more experience for you all. Uh, when I was teaching uh, English there, I got a poet from Canada. She came and sat in my class, and I told her, Two hours lesson, but you're not allowed to open your mouth. We'll analyze your poems, but you're not supposed to tell us what you think of it. And she sat for two hours. The students, the, the class was about 24, 25 students. They gave 25 different ideas and interpretations to every poem. And she just sat there quietly. She kept writing points, but uh, she didn't respond. At the end of it, we asked her to summarize. She said, you know, I think I'm a far greater poet than I consider myself to be. I never realized my poems had 25 different interpretations. You know, that was the beauty of interpreting something in front of you, the freedom and the joy to give it different directions and angles and things like that. So yeah, lots of experiences like that. School education should be like that. You know, it should be lifelong, deeply embedded in you. I think there are some questions on the chat group. Yes, sir. Uh, so what do you feel? Do we in school sometimes put up a put up a pretense of democracy, but are in fact scared of it? I'm, I think sometimes even the most democratic of places 
tend to lean into that. Nations do that. So yes, I mean, there's a system of method and following and putting streamlining into processes and procedures. You know, and you have to have a little bit of one size fits all. Uh, sometimes there's a debate, should you have uniforms and you should, sometimes there is, you shouldn't have uniforms. I think uniforms on one side make it exactly what they, the name has come from. They bring uniformity. The haves and the have nots, you can afford it. This, that doesn't happen in schools where people come in in their own home clothing. Sometimes that shows, you know, the affordability and the branding and all that starts showing. So there are pros and cons to everything in life. To expect that for everything, there'll be every democratic process. It's probably actually diluting the functioning and the structuring of the system. It's a balance. I told you one of the pillars was about balance and fair play. And I think if that comes in, then no one objects to a blend of certain fixation, even autocracy at times and democracy. But the whole framework, the fragment of the school should be, not the fragment, fragment is the wrong word, but the framework of the school should be based on democratic pillars. Thank you, sir, for that. We have another question here. Our schools have not implemented holistic report cards or assessment system. What is the way to implement such a system? The way is you. You mean every teacher, every participant in the school. And why don't we involve some of the students to design it? After all, they would be able to make the best input about how they want to be seen. But you should just go back to your own schooling system and say how much of the true you, who am I truly, how much of that reflected in your report card? And if it didn't, is the philosophy that it didn't happen to me, why should it happen to the next generation or the next, next, next generation? Or should you keep evolving? If you truly take Howard Garner and Daniel Gold in mind, two concepts which came up in the 90s and deeply influenced the way I shifted my thinking in ed school education. If you think about it, they make a lot of sense. And I think that is really what we need to do. So we need to keep evolving and we need to keep doing that. Now uh, you encourage everyone to participate. Everyone should, you know, everyone should be encouraged to give an answer. You rotate around. If a person gives the wrong answer, you don't punish the person. You don't call them names, but you encourage them to think and understand correctly. But there was a time when you were sidelined and you were made to feel that you had no knowledge and no brains purely because you gave the wrong answer and people would laugh at you. You know, there was a time when we, if we were differently abled, people used to condemn us and make fun of us. Today, we, I think we've improved. We've become a lot more empathetic about it. So I think our report cards should also bring in empathy and understanding for all types of learning and all kinds of talents, not just academics. I think even our selection to universities should be that they used to be based like that earlier. There's a wonderful light effect as the power is gone off. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for the answer and for the comment also. It's actually thunder, there's thunder and rain here, so. <laughs> oh, you're, you're blessed. At least you've got most parts of India not getting that. Any other <laughs> okay. questions? So we can, if we have stretchable yes, sir, we time, have one, we can stretch it. But, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we have one more question, sir. Does our academic system, whether in school or colleges, reflect the democratic values in society, or is it the other way around? So it's a very broad question, first of all. You know, let's let's just take one aspect, and that is assessment. If there are more choice making and there are more choices, and people can either answer this or that or whatever, that's one. OK, so there are more questions and you can choose from them an answer. That's a democratic process. If our questions are so framed that you can actually give a variety of answers and the scope for interpretation. All right, that is what children like these days. That is what students like rather than there is one fixed answer because of fixed knowledge. Those are statistics and all which is needed at times. There are lots of answers which have to have fixed answers, but there should be a segment which gives you scope for interpretation. And, uh, you know, and think, unfortunately, we've done that. Or the good old essay writing, for example, earlier, you know, gave you a lot of scope for a thing. Now, 
those kind of skills are dying out very rapidly. And so the freedom of expression is dying out into fixed norms. So it's the assessment which is the culprit, not the content or how we are going about it. Also, I think that um, it is up to us. You know, I feel that a time is coming where the students will have all the knowledge I told you in the mobile phone and the gadgets. There'll be a time when these earphones that I've got will be able to give me every answer. The glasses, if I wear them, will be the TV screen and they'll be accessing the internet. I just have to think about it and the answer will come on the screen. So even the assessment will have to change. You know, how are you going to judge all the technology is going to be so micro. There'll be chips in our bodies already beginning to happen, which will start doing everything. You've already got uh, artificial intelligence coming in and things like chat GPT who are giving you, giving you the writing novels for you, I think. There's a Thank you, sir, thought for process that. among yeah. the educationists. One last sentence. There's a thought process among the intellectuals that there will no longer be answers to questions. There will be answers and the students will be asked to frame the best questions. And marks will be given for how creative a question you create out of that. That'd be exciting. Thank you, sir, for that. Uh, Bupendra, can you please unmute yourself? You can ask your question. Good evening, sir. Hi, good evening. Sir, there was in a slide, there was one line stating understand without judging or not judging, even like in a relation with student. My, I want to know about the borderline in student teachers relationship in relation to change of heart from the perspective of academic excellence and behavior. The thought of one day he or she will change for much better and constructiveness. So where's the borderline? Like I, my expectation always want that the children should change or do very good in whichever field in school as well in subjects. But the change is like I'm not able to see till now. But is it a borderline where I should stop or it's a continuous process? <laughs> The moment, the moment you, a uh, good question and always a dilemma for all of us, but the moment you are embracing change, then there is no borderline, there is no line. Because how, if you moment you start confining change, yes, you can have a framework, but it, the framework itself can be very porous. So there's a scope yeah. to move beyond it, provided there are certain guidelines. I think our purpose, our very purpose, our very being, of having the schooling system mm -hmm. is to help every individual to grow, change, develop, become a more rounded person. Mm -hmm. Some do it very quickly. Some have a knack of falling into it very quickly. Some take a long time, right? And if you look uh, around your own friends, your own growing up in school and things like that, I think you'll have many answers where you could say, if only we could reverse time, we could have handled that differently. And think of that. I think everyone deserves a second chance, but not looking the yes, other way. Sir. The two different things. And we certainly need to give That's multiple right. chances, but not look the other way. There has to be counseling, there's got to be guidance, there's got to be direction giving. That's very important to accompany that. Thank you very much, sir. Welcome. 